of 1993. This was the first of eight scheduled days of hearings. Subcommittees will come to order. Uh, the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Brewster, has 15 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As one who happens to believe that uh, ATF and FBI do an awful lot right, uh, probably 90, 95 percent of your cases uh, are never heard of by the media or by the average American. Uh, my main interest in this is trying to figure out uh, what went wrong in the deal. Uh, I think that uh, some of my colleagues here are attempting to play a role. I can assure you I'm playing no role. I want to know uh, as much as I can about the information, and hopefully we can do some things differently next time so we don't ever again have a repeat of, of Waco. Uh, Mr. Donegan, do I understand that, uh, that you contacted the National Guard concerning uh, possible use of helicopters uh, because there was a methamphetamine lab on the premises? No, sir. I, my first contact with uh, the National Guard was for uh, aerial photography work. Uh, my initial memorandum made no mention of um, a drug nexus. I even instructed uh, one of the agents that made personal contact with those representatives, uh, Jose Viegra, to make sure that he told them that at that point we had no drug information. Um, at a time later, we had learned, uh, in fact, it was within a couple of days after that, uh, the date of that particular mem memorandum, we learned that at some time in the past that a disassembled methamphetamine laboratory had been seen by one of the branch divisions who left uh, who was away from the compound, and that um, a statement was made by uh, Vernon Howe that uh, he had called the sheriff's office and had abandoned that um, methamphetamine lab facility to them. Um, the, there was a, the person telling us the story said that uh, they never saw that uh, abandonment take place. We checked with the sheriff's office. They had never received a methamphetamine lab from anyone from the compound. And that's how that came about. Okay. Uh, who was first contacted by the deputy sheriff? You, Mr. Aguilar? Yes, sir, I was. Is it common to be contacted by a deputy sheriff as opposed to the sheriff or undersheriff? Well, actually, sir, um, <clears throat> the information was given to me on paper by Special Agent Charles Meyer out of the Austin office. Okay. Who, in turn, received the information from Lieutenant Barber. But is it common? Do any of you, have you ever been contacted by a deputy sheriff as opposed to the sheriff? Sure. Okay. Yes, sir. It is common. We, I guess, uh, I'm thinking back to Oklahoma where we had a sheriff uh, that a deputy attempted to frame with the FBI a couple of years ago. Uh, at any rate, uh, were all of you involved, or any of you involved, in the decision on dynamic entry? You're the, the top-ranking man, Mr. Hartnett, are you not? Yes, sir. I, I was advised of it. You were involved in the decision on dynamic entry? I approve the plan, which then term dynamic entry, I really don't know a, a good definition for it. Nor but, do I. Uh, but the raid plan, yes, sir. I am the person who approved it. What about the rest of you? Did you have any involvement in making, helping make the decision on the way that uh, we addressed the problem there? You talked as far as the dynamic entry or? On dynamic what, entry? Yes, it, well, there was really a, a panel of, of several um, SACs, which are special agents in charge, several s assistant special agents in charge, several of our SRT team leaders, 
which um, discussed the various options or whatever and came to a conclusion to do the dynamic entry. I happen to be one who's uh, convinced myself, at least, that uh, Mr. Koresh was a bad guy. Uh, I am convinced that he had altered some weapons. Uh, from the testimony we've heard, you certainly have to believe there were some child abuse cases and some others. But it's hard for me to understand how you arrived at the decision of dynamic entry. Uh, isn't it true that Mr. Koresh went to town uh, on a fairly regular basis? He'd, he'd been there on, on several occasions. One thing that is, has been misunderstood, I think, for the, for the last couple years is during this investigation, we determined that at the compound, machine guns were being manufactured and explosive devices. Our goal through this investigation was to execute a search warrant on that house to obtain those illegal weapons. Other people were involved in the manufacture and possession of those. The arresting of Karish was just a side issue. If we arrested him, we still had to do the search warrant on the house. As you know, it turned out there was machine guns and hand guns. That was our goal. We knew that machine guns were being manufactured. We had to get in, into there one way or another. If we arrested him off, we still had to do the search warrant. So a lot of people have felt, you know, the whole thing was to arrest David Creech. That was not our goal. But was there anyone else anywhere in the group that had the charisma, the leadership ability of a David Koresh to convince people who were engineers and lawyers to follow him in some of the crazy things that were done here? I mean, there, there were several professional people in there, but he was very charismatic, and, and they followed him. So is there any reason to believe that had you arrested him, it would have not been fairly easy to do the rest of it? Well, there's two things that could happen. I mean, they could have, if we arrested him, he could have turned into a martyr, and then they would say, they've taken our leader. Here we have all these machine guns and hand grenades. He's taught them for years. You know, the time has come. And, you, you know, could have lost a whole bunch of people. Yes. Yeah. If I may, Mr. Rooster, um, another point I'd like to make out here is that uh, Koresh was observed outside of the compound on two occasions. Uh, one was, I believe, January 17th of 93, and the other February 24th of 93. Which was, uh, what, three days, four days before the raid? No, sir. That was 17th. Uh, this was maybe weeks before the raid. I thought the raid was the 28th. The 28th, February 28th. I'm sorry, I thought you said February 24th. I'm sorry, February 24th, yes, sir. So that's four days before. Yes, sir. <laughs> Not April. And uh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake here. But we didn't actually obtain the warrant, and the warrant wasn't issued until February 25th. But so you started planning this clear back about six months ago, right? And uh, actually, the planning, uh, the way I read it, started in December on uh, the dynamic entry, the raid on the, on the facility. We started planning it in December, but at that time we were planning for a siege. We were not planning to do a dynamic entry. At what point did you determine to do the dynamic entry? It was in January. And you brought... Uh, Special response teams in, right? Well, their team leaders came in, and that's why I said we had these meetings for, for months that we went through, and, and basically, you know, we weighed the options of the assault versus the siege. You know, and we got a lot of new information that, that kind of put us over the hump. But if we did a siege, I mean, one thing, as you've heard some of the testimony today, mass suicide. As we talked to everybody, Davey was on the interviews, we had our SRT team leaders go, there was a big fear of everybody that there would be mass suicide. Um, secondly, you know, if we tried to do a siege, we knew that there was machine guns in there, we knew that there's hand grenades, it would have a long time to prepare. In other words, by doing a dynamic entry, they wouldn't have time to prepare. We knew that they had supplies of food and water that could last for a long time. We knew it would what be... What is a, a long time? I think they had MREs for three months and, you know, wa their own w water well. Um, we knew it would be a disruption to the community. You know, if, if you did that, it'd be a long-term financial commitment. You know, Karish is in control. If you do a siege, you know, he calls the shots. You know, we were concerned about the sexual abuse, that this was going on, that would continue on. We were concerned about the destruction of evidence. You know, 
that if they made those machine guns, if they made those hand grenades, and we said, hey, we're here as, you know, to do a search warrant, come out, and they don't come out, they could take them apart as quickly as, as they put them in. Yeah. And as it, as it turned out, every one of these things happened. And that was one of the reasons yeah. we switched from the siege to the... Mr. Thurman, yeah. when you have special response teams, uh, isn't it generally in response to people being heavily armed? Don't you generally bring them in? when we would use those? You yes, bring them we in. would use them in when a high-risk situation. Armed. They're very highly trained in individuals, and we use them as safety both for the people and for, and for the agents, because they are, are, are highly Are they well armed themselves? Pardon, sir? Are the special response teams well armed themselves? Yes, sir, yes, sir they are. What do you, what's their ordinary armament? They'd have a not, you know, their 9 millimeter standard gun and then an MP5 or you know, maybe a shotgun, depending on where they were going or, or what the specific, you know. So what we heard then about some of the agents only having 9 millimeter sidearms is not correct? No, so, some of them only had 9 millimeter. Yeah, I mean, they have, they have the option. Each operation, they kind of plan out what they think they'll need or, or, or whatever. Some, some that day we knew, you know, that obviously that there was women and, and children and, and there was some expression by some of the undercover agents that we may have to get in a fist fight with some people or whatever. So some of them were actually concerned that, that, that they didn't take a second gun that they actually had there because if they got into a fight, they didn't want to be trying to hold one gun or whatever. If, uh, if you're going into a, a well-armed situation, why would you not arm them completely uh, uh, to the best of uh, anything possible? Well, I mean, the, there were so many things to consider here. There was women and children. You know, we knew that they were, they were separated. We had, you know, teams divided in different areas to take care of that. But, you know, you, you need to have, you know, the weapons that, that, that you need, but we didn't feel they would be armed at that time or where, where we would, you know. If, uh, if you stage this at 3 in the morning, why wouldn't that have been a better time for surprise than 10 in the morning? The men and, and women were separated 24 hours a day. There wasn't a lot of light inside the compound. And normally we do execute our warrants first thing in the morning. We're talking about eight or 10 agents going into a room or a house where maybe there's four or five people. We estimated that there were 75 people in there. We knew there was 100 plus members, but they always you know, came and left and, and there wasn't a, a solid number. We're sending 75 agents into a building and you get inside going in different directions, it's dark, one, one round goes off and, you know, we had a real concern that the women and children or, or whatever, we wouldn't see who shot where or whatever, and it could turn into a tragic incident. So it, the more I listen, the more I can't understand why David Koresh was not arrested outside. Uh, you used flashbang grenades uh, at, the, at the start of it, correct? The, the only, um, there was no plan to, to just use them. When upstairs, which people have seen the video on TV where there's the two rooms where they're going into. One of those rooms was David Carice's bedroom. The other room was his armory where they had the machine guns, the hand grenades in there. They were going to look to see if anybody's in there. Before they can throw it, they have to make sure there's nothing flammable or whatever. Then they throw it in and it's really just a distraction device. I mean, it makes a loud noise and it's a flash and, and the purpose of it it's not to harm anybody or, or whatever, but just to stun them for a second so you can get in yeah. and safely. It's for their protection and, and for the agent's protection. It's not That's an offensive though. type weapon. Mr. Hartnett, uh, there's a rumor, and surely it's unfounded, that the publicity person or public relations person for ATF had released uh, some kind of a press uh, communication the night before to uh, media around the country that something big was going to come down in Texas. Yes, and we heard that, and, and um, the person, I believe her name was Sharon Wheeler, she's testified before committees, and, and she just did not give any information out about Waco, Texas at all. She was in, um, she was in Dallas, and she called, um, called a reporter to ask if he was going to be in, or called two reporters, I'm not quite sure, I don't recall, but and said, are you going to be in? We're gonna have something coming up in the next day or two. As I recall, that's how it came out. She never mentioned Waco. Why These, did she do that? She wanted to be able to get a hold of them if there was a story and they recovered these arms. Now, these, this all came up after the fact that we heard this, and it came out at hearings before. 
Wouldn't it be ample time after they were recovered? Oh, yes. I mean, but what came out, it, it didn't come out the way, you know, she was accused of calling them and saying, there's going to be a, a raid at Waco tomorrow, and that's, that's just not what occurred. It's always easy to uh, look at something in hindsight. Hindsight's 2020, and foresight isn't nearly that good. But when you've had four federal employees killed, 20 wounded, and a large number of civilians um, that were killed in the process, I've got to think you're looking forward to making some changes in the way that you would do things in the future. Have those changes been made to make sure that a Waco never happens again? I'm retired now, and... Uh, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Well, then. I still worry about it. I understand. I still worry about it. I worry about it every day of my life. Uh, I think there are changes. I see things that, that, that happened at Waco that, uh, that we should have done differently. Um, I think those agents are within ATF are some of the best equipped, best trained, most professional law enforcement people in this country and always have been and, and I think always will be. I think that their dedication, you know, going in there that day, they felt they were well prepared and they mm -hmm. felt they were doing the right thing. And uh, we need to correct the things that went wrong there. And there were things that went wrong, particularly... On the, on the helicopters, uh, it just occurred to me that we're flying that day. Were they National Guard or were they Army? National Guard. Did the governor give permission to use them, or who had done that? Yeah, they come out of that J... Joint Task Force. Joint Task Force. They were Texas Air National Guard? Yes, sir. Under the governor's direction? That's correct. So the governor had given permission to use them? Yes, sir. Okay. You mentioned, too, about the, the training of, uh, of your forces, and I understand they are well trained. Yet, do I understand that the Army spent three days uh, or more working with them as well? At Fort Hood, uh, we had asked to use the facility down there so that everyone knew where they were going in the plan, and the, uh, the military actually gave advice on things that they saw that they felt that we should change or whatever. But uh, it was not that we asked them come and give us training. It was we were borrowing their facility to use that, to have a mock-type situation uh, so that there could be some training and everybody be familiar where everybody was, was going during the raid. And you had approximately 100 uh, BATF personnel there? I think pretty close to it. <coughs> yes, sir. I think it was like 80, actually, down there at Fort Hood. So you were expecting problems bringing that large force in, is that correct? I, I don't think we were, we were preparing for any event. There was, uh, in the plan, things that, that took, it was so spread out, the compound, and so large that we wanted to make sure that we could separate and get those guns separated before anybody could get to them. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we would get the men before they got when, to the When gun. the element of surprise was lost, who made the decision to continue? The commander in charge of the raid. And that was? Well, I don't know if the commander knew that he lost the element of surprise, and that is Chuck Sarabin here. Did you know about the loss of the element of surprise, Chuck? First of all, as far as the, the element of surprise, it's, it's been an issue that's been also popped around in the newspaper or, or, or whatever for, for, for years. And there appears that at some level there was an order given or, or someone told somebody, you know, not to go if you lost the element of surprise. Okay. Let me see if I can understand this in my mind. Somebody goes up to the door, knocks on the door with a search warrant in their hand. Is there someone else standing there with a weapon as well? In this particular incident? Yes. I was not at the, fr at the front door, so I can't. Uh, but somebody, some ATF agent goes to the front door, knocks on it with a search warrant in hand, and says, we're here to arrest David Koresh and search the building. Am I correct? Right. Well, they would say to execute a search warrant, I believe. And there's another guy standing here with a weapon? Or the is the guy by himself? Th th that I don't know. I think, sir, at least what I've been told is that... Just ask as you to... Uh, I would like to... Your time is up if you can kind of condense and, and I will bring it together quickly. I have been told that as our people came up in front of the compound and were disembarking, that David Korish was standing in front of his front door. and Outside? Outside. 
by the door and that two different agents i believe it was two called federal agents with a search warrant he stepped back inside and the agent who was there in the front door or by the front door was wounded they fired just came right out and and uh, shot the agents now mr johnston was there at the trial and heard all the testimony and and could probably but those agents were armed themselves as well yes they were okay thank you mr Chairman. thank you uh gentleman from north carolina mr heineman for five minutes thank you mr chairman i'd like to continue this line of questioning but i see here that that uh, day two covered the planning of the raid so i will i will restrict myself to the intelligence gathering prior to that uh, that meeting where the raid was planned um, i did read this book by mr noble the uh, the report of department of treasury on the on the waco incident and of course he'll be here on the fifth fourth or fifth day to answer questions but in that book on page nine it indicates that um, treasury Department stated that they chose not to try to lure David Koresh away from the compound because intelligence reports he rarely ventures off compound grounds. That's found on page nine. And certainly today we've we've heard conflicting testimony from from someone, Mr. Thibodeau, from in the compound. Uh, and I'd like to uh, I'd like to address to Mr. Sarbin or perhaps um, uh, the agent himself. Uh, as to when that when that house that observation house was set up outside the compound the uh, the house was started up in january and, and some of the conflicting reports as far as what you're hearing on how many times he, he was off the surveillance at the beginning was for 24 hours and then then it broke down to where they were just basically doing it from sunlight to to late at night um, obviously there were several vehicles in there that the Surveillance house actually, I believe, only saw him one time leave, as far as the agents observing him leave. There was cars going and come. Obviously, he could have been in a car that they, that they didn't see it. Um, there was also conversation with, with the undercover agent that, um, you know, he, he doesn't go off the compound. He said he was getting paranoid about law enforcement or, or whatever. So the combination of the information we had at the time was that we only observed him the one time. And what he had told the undercover agent, you know, we didn't feel that he was going off the, off the compound. Well, who was in charge of that house? Well, there were several agents there. Uh, Dale Littleton was actually to, to supervise the, uh, the undercover agents. And then he was under Earl, and then Earl would report to me. And then Dale would also call me with information directly. Well, where did that, where did that flow of information terminate? Did that stay with you in the, in the Waco area, or did it go? No, to it would. You know, after the, their reports would be put on an ATF form 3270.2, which it, it would come through Earl, then it would come to me, and this was distributed to all the SACs, all, all the ASACs, all the different SRT team members, so they got all the information. And then any time that we um, had a plan, as far as meeting in a group of 15 or 20 to discuss both the case and what what we were going to do tactically, Dale would come and represent the, uh, you know, all the undercover agents and give us a briefing on what was going on. What use did you make of the local agencies, either the Texas Rangers or the Sheriff's Department, relative to intelligence? I spoke to um, DPS intelligence and obtained information, information that I already had and secured. Um, I requested information through headquarters. Most of the information that I had, or that they had, I had already had been provided with. So there wasn't much that they could give me other than what I had. Okay, let me, let me at this point, I, I pretty much touched on what I wanted to touch on. The previous gentleman across the aisle took some of what I was going to ask. But at this time, I'd like to yield the balance of my time to Mr. Barr to continue his line of questioning. I appreciate the gentleman from North Carolina. Uh, Mr. Johnston, following up uh, just briefly on our line of questioning earlier, and my concern over uh, destruction of evidence or non-production of, of evidence, uh, there were, apparently was a, was a settlement uh, agreement in the uh, Wanowski case. Are you familiar with that? 
Uh, uh, and the, yeah. the reason I'm asking is par apparently the settlement documents provided uh, for destruction of uh, certain discovery files, and I'm wondering if you're aware of that. Uh, uh, Wanoski had a, uh, I guess, civil service claim. Is right. that? I know nothing about that at all. I guess that's something that uh, Treasury handled. Would that would that be unusual if there is a a case handled not by the civil service but by its successor agency, the Merit System Protection Board, and as part of a settlement, uh, in this case reinstatement with back pay, uh, that uh, documents uh, would be destroyed, in including in this case apparently or, or perhaps documents uh, relating to possible wrongdoing. Would that be something that would concern you as a well, as a, a government attorney? If you're saying destroyed as in all in all destroyed and no copies, well then that's obviously concerning because you don't have any, I mean, there's no evidence. So I don't, I guess I've never heard of that process well, such I, as I that. Had, I had neither, but then again, I haven't heard of the documents that I, that I showed you earlier. But that, that would concern you as a prosecutor? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. I the appreciate the gentleman from North Carolina. Gentleman's time has expired. Um, the uh, chair recognizes Mr. Ehrlich, the vice chair of the subcommittee for five minutes. I'd like to direct, uh, I have five minutes, so I'd appreciate, I'll try to frame my questions concisely, I'd appreciate concise answers. Mr. Aguilera, uh, did any person in a supervisory chain above you ever ask you to gather information with respect to the issue of arresting Koresh outside the compound? <clears throat> um, the information, I, I didn't, they didn't request for me to obtain the information to try and arrest uh, Koresh out, outside, no, no sir. Okay. Now, earlier today, Mr. McMahon testified that you specifically declined an offer from Koresh over the telephone that he, wherein he allegedly said, come visit, I'll show you the guns. Is that a true statement of fact? That's true. That's a true statement. Uh, however, the only reason I didn't want to talk to Koresh was because I had prior knowledge and information that Koresh had dealings with McMahon, and I wanted to further check his records in order for me to find out whether or not Koresh was dealing without a license. So you thought that offer was premature at the time, that's why you declined yes, the sir. offer? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It would have uh, been non-productive for my case, for my investigation. Thank you. Mr. Sarabrin, uh, my question to you, sir, is did you ever have occasion to draft a memo wherein you suggest that Koresh be arrested outside the compound? I don't remember drafting a, a memo. I do know that we did consider it and, and tried two or three options to try to do that, but I, I don't remember drafting a, a memo. So your recollection is you did not actually draft the memo, but is it your recollection? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is it your recollection that you, you remember observing or, or well, we considered, reviewing the memo? We, we considered and actually tried to do a couple things where, where we could arrest him off, but I don't remember or recall preparing any memo. And there came a point in time where that option was rejected, correct? We, we actually, well, one of them was to go to the Health and Human Services where they would call him off and say, you know, we want to talk to you or whatever. And we went and talked to them, and they said, well, he doesn't show up for three or four days, and we couldn't plan when. And which I tried to explain earlier, no matter where or when we arrested Karish, we still had to do a, a search warrant on the compound. And we knew that would involve a lot of people. So, you know, like with the health and human, they declined it at the end. But had we done that, you know, we couldn't have sat around with, with 100 agents for five days till he showed up because we still had to execute the search warrant on his house. Sir, is it fair to say that at some point in time you changed your mind with, with respect to the uh, appropriateness of arresting Koresh outside the compound? Yeah, I would say 
Well, when I'm talking of, of, of our decisions, so there's a group here of about 15 or 20 people that would discuss this, you know, at various times. On what, and yes, we did, did, did change. He was from the undercover, and we had, as Davey got information, some of the people that had left the compound still had people on the compound or whatever. And, and the sense was that, you know, he was getting, you know, very paranoid and not trusting his own people or whatever. Thank you. Mr. Hardnett. Uh, two questions real briefly. Is it your testimony, sir, that the element of surprise was lost prior to the raid on February 28th? I have, of course, heard the element of surprise since the day after the raid. Yes, sir. Prior to that time, I never heard the term element of surprise. The whether or not that, and Mr. Hanowski, of course, is, was the SAC in, in Houston, and I've asked him many times since the raid, did you feel the raid was compromised when you went in? And he has said no to this day, and I believe him. Thank you, sir. Sir, earlier you testified that mistakes were made in the remaining time that we have, and I realize it's very easy, as has been repeated many times here tonight, it's very easy being a Monday morning quarterback. What would you have done differently uh, in retrospect? There was a, when the undercover agent came out of the uh, compound and met with, uh, well, I thought he was going to meet with Chuck Sarabin. When I was briefed, he was going to come out and let Chuck know the status after the Waco Trib had come out. Were they going, were they getting out guns? Were they going to battle stations? That type of thing. At the time of the briefing, I never asked the question as to how they were communicating. They communicated by phone. The most important conversation we had in this entire raid took place over the telephone between the undercover agent and Mr. Sarabin. I didn't ask the question at the time the plan was given to me. If I had of, or if I'd thought of it, um, that would never have happened. They would have met in person. They would have discussed what they saw. There would have been no communications gap between what the undercover agent saw and felt and what Chuck was thinking. Um, that to me was was a serious mistake, and uh, and I didn't catch it at the time. Well, sure, I know our time is up. Time. But, uh, are you finished your answer, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Taylor from Mississippi. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Aguilera, is that right? Aguilera, yes, sir. I'm sorry. Aguilera. Aguilera. In page 19 of this, it talks about your conversation with Deputy Barber, who unfortunately has already left us. Talking about it be an attempt for Koresh to kill George Roden or Rodden, his predecessor, the preacher he replaced at gunpoint. Correct. Do you feel like there was adequate evidence given to you by Mr. Barber that this actually took place? that he ran off the previous preacher at gunpoint and actually shot at him, that he was found behind, hiding behind a tree? Well, yes, sir. I read the report. Do you believe that to be true? Yes, sir. Did that influence your decision on how you were to serve this warrant, the fact that this man had been shown it, to have violent tendencies and the use of firearms even against another preacher? I had no, uh, I didn't partake in the planning of the raid or the execution of the warrant. Did that influence your decision? Or the decision, do you feel like, I'm okay. I, let, me, let me go a little bit farther to page 27. Again, the, these are statements attributed to you, but not direct quotes. It says, Aguilera sought information from former cult members who gave him some insight into the extraordinary degree to which Koresh dominated the lives of compound residents. Cult members surrendered all their assets to Koresh and permitted him to have sex with all female members of the cult. While Koresh, while reports that Koresh was permitted to sexually and physically abuse children were not evidence that firearms or explosives violations were occurring, they showed Koresh to have set up a world of his own where legal prohibitions were discarded freely. Do you believe that to be an accurate statement? Uh, according, or uh, from the information that I had received from former members, it was placed in my probable cause in the affidavit. Yes, 
I do believe it was true. Do you think that in fairness to the four officers who lost their lives and the 20 officers who were wounded, in fairness to their widows, in fairness to the two children who will not now have a father, that maybe some of these things ought to be brought to the attention of this committee? And do you think that in fairness to those people, this series that was about to be printed in the Waco Tribune and has since been printed should be entered into the record? Yes, sir. Don't you think that in fairness to the ATF agents that you should be treated the same as every criminal and that at least you're given the presumption that you're innocent until proven guilty? That we should be treated as criminals? No, sir. I think that I'm you sorry. should be treated at least as well as the criminals in this country and given the presumption that you're innocent until proven guilty and given the opportunity to prove yourself innocent. Don't you think it would be fair for this committee to do that? Yes. And don't you think it would help your case if you were able to talk about the events that led up to the raid? Yes, sir. Okay. My final points I'd, I'd like to make is, after talking to Deputy Barber, at some point in those conversations, did he request or did a member of the Sheriff's Department request the help of the ATF, or did the ATF just on their own decide that they were going to descend upon Waco, Texas and pick on some poor country preacher? I did the complete investigation on my own. I didn't request any assistance from the Sheriff's Office except for the intelligence that I had been receiving from them. The question was the other way around. Did the Sheriff's Department at some point request your help? Yes, sir, they did initially. So you did not just pick Waco off the map of the United States and decide that you would go down there? No, sir. You were requested by a local governing authority, the law enforcement authority, to yes, come sir. down and help you? Yes, sir. Do you think that ought to be included in the record? In, yes, sir. In, in the raid? Well, don't you think we ought to talk about the events that led up yes, to sir. this? Yes, sir. Sure. So that people will know that? Yes, sir. Because I can assure you there are a heck of a lot of people in this country who think that y'all just picked that town and that preacher. And I don't think that's fair to the four men who died. No, sir. It's and not. I don't think it's fair to the 20 men who got wounded. No, sir. Is there anything else you'd like to say, Mr. Aguilar? No, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Laughlin of California, you have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Dr. Per Perry, I've uh, read through all of the uh, material you uh, provided about the evaluation of the children who were evacuated by yourself and the team, and also the um, transcript uh, of your transmittal, I think of March 11th, if I'm reading the date correctly, to the FBI where you recount uh, the, the status of the children. Can you uh, tell this committee what your impression was about uh, the level of uh, sexual molestation going on in the compound after you had examined these children? as well as what information you had gathered from them about explosive materials, weapons, and things of that nature, and, and what of that did you transmit to the FBI? We, uh, within the first week after working with these children, um, in a variety of ways, it became clear that there were two primary areas of secret that they wanted to keep from the Babylonians, the non-believers, who we were in their minds. These included uh, over time, as these kids slowly revealed in a variety of ways what these were, they included two major themes. One was that there was uh, this, and they had been told that people would not understand this, this, uh, this special relationship that they were going to have with David. And of course, uh, so they were right. This, the sexuality, regard. the fact that sex was openly talked about, that young children were exposed to inappropriate sexual content, and that by the age of 12, all children were considered adults, and all girls were therefore available to David for his wife. As we heard today, obviously, the age of 12 is pushing the limit. He clearly partook his pleasures in younger children as well. At that time, it was also clear that these kids looked at us with smugness and said, well, you'll see what'll happen, and you don't know what's gonna happen. And you, and, could I specifically ask a, a question on, because yes. I, I wasn't very direct, on the second page of your mem memorandum, you talk about one a child, that the children knew beyond what their years would indicate about weapons, and one young boy in particular discussing his grenade, the grenade launcher. 
was the, that? These children knew uh, a lot more about guns than you would expect for children this age. Children as young as six years old uh, would pick up a toy wooden gun, pull the bolt back, weigh it as if getting the balance, look down the barrel and say, this isn't a real gun. Could, could, could I ask, Mr. Johnson, were you aware of this information about the, the evidence in the children as to weapons and possible violations when, the, when you reviewed the information uh, seeking the warrant? There was some information. Joy Sparks uh, spoke with a young child that said, uh, I can't wait till I'm a man, something of that nature. And she said, why? And he said, because then I'll get a long gun. And once again, that in and of itself, a uh, long gun may or may not mean a machine gun, but it indicated the kids had knowledge of guns. Um, as far as the question concerning sexual abuse, the, the Kiri Jewel story, we did know. Let, let me ask finally, and then I want to yield to Mr. Scott. Uh, Mr. Sarabin, you mentioned that you were aware uh, that there was uh, sexual abuse um, going on in the compound as you were readying for uh, the final uh, days. Um, I wonder if um, you could uh, tell me, we all, you take an oath to uphold the law, and the law that you're uh, upholding is to enforce alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. But as a law enforcement officer, was it in your mind that little girls were being raped uh, inside the walls of this compound while you, while you were and the rest were waiting to execute this warrant. Was that a factor in timing, uh, it, it, even it, subconsciously? It a, as a law enforcement officer, as, as a human being, it, it was inside of you. I heard the testimony er, earlier today, and as we interviewed I, these people, and, and, and we heard those stories. I mean, we, it, you know, we, we had talked to her before, so. And, and you, I, I guess, had seen this, this sinful uh, messiah story. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I wonder if we could ask unanimous consent to put this news article in the record. It's the sinful messiah from the Waco Tribune Herald that's been referenced several times. Is it uh, reserving the right to object? Is this a, um, this is an article that appeared before the raid on the, uh, uh, yes. on the compound? Does it mention anything about firearms violation? I think it, it talks about the, the sexual abuse that I think was in the minds of the agents and as human beings and law enforcement <coughs> officers was a factor, an un understandable one, if, if I'm hearing Mr. Serebin correctly, as to timing. Well, continuing my reservation, do the agents have any, anything in writing, any memos from this particular time that demonstrate that because of alleged sexual abuse, that motivated their thinking about the planning of this firearms law enforcement raid. This is the first I've heard of all of this. I yield the gentleman from New York. I thank the gentleman. This article, which occurred the day before the raid, which was published by the Waco, whatever, Herald something? Tribune Herald. Tribune Herald. Um, which was published the day before the raid, plays a very important role in what happened in a variety of ways. If you read the report of ATF, there's a whole chapter on it because, and this is an important question we will deal with today and tomorrow, one of the, the timing of the, ra the, the uh, ATF people went to the Waco Herald Tribune, Tribune Herald and asked them to not run the article when they decided they would run the article, they moved the day up. It may account for some of the speed with which the raid went. I think any of the gentlemen who were involved will back me up that this was an extremely important article in terms of what happened, and by all means it should be in the record whether it mentioned firearms or not. What is also important here is what ATF thought, correctly or incorrectly, and we can debate that, is that the publication of the article would influence Koresh's state of mind and that was an important factor in determining when and how to do the raid. With, with, uh, reclaiming sure. my time, I understand the gentleman's point, uh, but continuing my reservation for the moment, I've asked two questions. I would be grateful if the person uh, offering this uh, into the record or one of the witnesses can clarify it. My first question very simply is, does that article have anything to do with firearms violation? I think it, it does, yes. yes. Okay. The, the second is, with respect to the, the references in that article to sexual abuse and now the testimony that because of this uh, uh, sexual abuse that motivated the 
uh, ATF to have to do this rate all the faster. I have if, one. If question. I may interrupt, I don't yeah. think that was the testimony, no, that, that sir. That was not my, my, my testimony. I'm yeah. sorry. I did not mean. I did not mean to alter your testimony. Uh, I'll let you phrase it. It's getting kind of late for all of us, so I apologize if I've misstated anything. The article faced or made us move the the rate up. Okay. She asked me as a person, did I have a feeling that I knew that sexual assaults or rapes were going on in the compound, did that affect me as a human being? I said, yes, as a law enforcement officer or whatever, I had a feeling about that. As a law enforcement officer, do you have anything in writing from right before the raid that indicated the raid had to take place in a certain way and a certain speed because of your concern as a human being about child sexual abuse? No. Thank you. Um, I, th I think I've made my points, Mr. Chairman, about the documents. I think the points have been made in, in its favor. We've been letting in about everything to be fair, so I will withdraw my, res my uh, reservation. Without objection, so ordered. It will be entered in the testimony. Uh, you, Mrs. Laughlin, you have two minutes left. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this point, I would like to yield the balance of my time to Mr. Scott. Thank you, um, <clears throat> and thank the lady from um, from, from California. <coughs> Excuse me, um, Mr. D Mr. Johnston, um, have you ever gotten evidence in court under the good faith exception to the to the exclusionary rule? I have uh, had a judge rule in the alternative that evidence would be admissible under that. Say that again. In other words, I've had courts rule that there was probable cause, but if the appellate court were to find not, then the agent would have had good faith in relying on it. In other words, an alternative finding, but I don't think I've had to rely entirely on have it. Have you had evidence excluded from no. court because it had been illegally obtained? No, sir. Do you know of any uh, evidence that's been offered in uh, your jurisdiction where the evidence was found to be illegally obtained and was excluded? <coughs> I don't recall any in the uh, Waco division. The Western District of Texas is huge. I'm um, sure there has been somewhere, but not not in our division okay. that I recall. Let me ask uh, Mr. Ag Ag Aguilera. Uh, do you have any problem obeying the law? Sir? Do you have any problem obeying the law? No, sir. Um, are you aware of any officer who's been sanctioned for illegally obtaining evidence? No, sir. So the exclusionary rule is about the only sanction we have against officers violating the law. I'm not the evidence. If you if you illegally obtain evidence and it's not admissible in court, that's about the only sanction you've heard yes, of sir. for illegally obtaining evidence. Yes, sir. And it's the only sanction we have, the only protection we have against law enforcement officers breaking the law. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a yield, chair yields to the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I start my question, let me make a couple of statements. I uh, spent eight years as a prosecutor, or eight years of the Arizona Attorney General's oh, office. I, I apologize. I got two people talking in my ear. Uh, by prior arrangement, the, can I just hold you up for a second? Certainly. Can we sh shift back over to Jackson Lee of Texas? Thank apologize. you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would like, Mr. Chairman, if I could uh, raise a question with the chair uh, so that my questions will be understood by the witnesses. I want to ask questions, and I will ask the witnesses to give me yes or no answers. I want to make it clear that I'm not in any way trying to limit their response as much as I am trying to get a number of questions in, and I want to make uh, and clarify my, uh, my particular questions. Uh, and let me also, Mr. Chairman, before my time starts, I see that it has, I was asking you to allow me to do that before my time starts, uh, to thank uh, Curtis Collins on the record uh, for yielding time to me previously. Mr. Um, Moulton, uh, you've had to be exceedingly quiet over there, and so let me try to uh, call from you some of the concerns that I have. It seems that little uh, Carrie Jewell said it all when she was trying to suggest that a lot of people were trying to get things out of this and we just need to fix it. I hope that if we can all eliminate the garments of hypocrisy that that is what we are trying to do, is to fix it. 
So it's my understanding uh, that there was an investigation that proceeded for how long, Mr. Moulton? Uh, approximately five months, an investigation conducted by the Treasury Department. Can you tell me what this book is, Mr. Moulton? That's, that is the Treasury Department report issued in September 1993 that addresses virtually all, if not all, of the questions Going that have been addressed yes today. No. I'm sorry. I'll do my best to say yes or no. That's all right. Did you participate in this uh, inquiry? Uh, yes, I was a project director of that investigation. In the course of trying to review extensively uh, what occurred in this tragedy, loss of lives of adults and children, loss of lives of our law enforcement officers, I want to get right to the point of focusing on corrective measures. In this document, is there a corrective measure that says, let us eliminate um, a portion of the exclusionary rule, meaning that search warrants are not good anymore, let's base them all on good faith? Is that, is that in this document? There is no suggestion of alteration of the exclusionary rule in the document, no. So that worked for you in terms of this document? That's correct. We had a problem, as we've heard some of the witnesses testify, in a point when there was no retreat. This is a point when we heard possibly that someone uh, tipped the media in this report, do you have at least a suggestion of some intervening factor or line authority that would have given the opportunity for fair analysis so that a possible retreat could have occurred, therefore saving lives? Uh, the report discusses uh, the importance of a an operation like this being reviewed at the Treasury Department substantially in advance of the raid rather than 48 hours before the raid, as was the case here. One of the things that I heard also mentioned, uh, because the American people need to know we hold a high regard this whole idea of religion and respect for people's differences. I've heard the Seventh-day Adventist Church being mentioned. And I would uh, wonder in this particular document, for it is quite distinguishable from a religion and a cult, do we have in this document any um, suggestion of further training or enhanced training for our law enforcement agencies about cults? that the document addresses the need for law enforcement agencies to consult experts in uh, organizations or groups like the Branch Davidian uh, before they conduct or in order to evaluate the information uh, that they're be being given by members of the cult and by others. You think cults are different from religion? Yeah, I, I, think, that, uh, I think that Dr. Perry expressed uh, uh, the difference quite well earlier. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a joint statement of uh, Mr. Rosedale, President of American Family Foundations, and William Rollin, President of Cult Awareness Network. And you had indicated to me, Mr. Chairman, I hope I can have a moment where the clock is stopping, that we would be open to potentially having witnesses come in and talk about issues that have longstanding impact on our ability to reform. I'd like this uh, statement submitted for the record, but I'd like the opportunity to raise with the committee a possibility of a cult expert coming in and testifying. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent. With that to object. The, the document is what? I, I asked General Lee to text I'll be happy. It's the joint statement of uh, the President of the American Family Foundation and the President of the Cult Awareness Network. It is relevant, Mr. Schiff, and I appreciate your inquiry, um, because uh, one of the suggestions was uh, that uh, our law enforcement agencies, in terms of reform and correction, needed additional training in cult awareness, uh, for they may come upon these kinds of groups across the nation, and of course that, that played into the tragedy that occurred. And this document is simply a report on cult, and it also addresses the particular incident in Waco. Continuing my reservation, uh, first, I believe that Mr. Perry is on the board of this organization, and he's been a witness here at, at this proceedings. He did not get the opportunity to give all of his testimony? No, Mr. Perry, I don't think. That's Dr. Perry, am Dr. I Perry. correct? That's <coughs> Dr. Dr. Perry, I, I, and I'm not on the board of... I'm on a, a research advisory board for the American Family Foundation, which is comprised of six academics or seven academics. Okay. It's right, not, that's the extent of my relationship with those organizations. Right. Well, continuing my reservation, if I, if I could just ask, uh, does the lady offer, is the lady offering this document, does that mean that we are committed to the idea that, that the Branch Davidian group was a cult? I don't, not, offer it in that, I don't offer it in that capacity at all, Mr. Schiff. I offer it as an explanatory document, not in all. I don't think it's a truth of, it's a veracity question. Uh, I withdraw my reservation. As far as the admission in the record, uh, without objection so ordered, as far as uh, a potential witness, uh, as we had talked about earlier, would certainly be willing to consider it. 
And Mr. Chairman, but I we, wonder because of the colloquy that we just had whether I can, the, the red light is on, but. Uh, so you have 30 say. seconds left regardless of what the red light says. Let me just ask uh, Mr. Moulton, was there a cover-up? Absolutely not. Let me go quickly to Mr. By Owens. Uh, uh, not, not by the Treasury, I'm sorry. Not by the Treasury Department in the preparation of that report, absolutely not. Let me ask Mr. Owens so that my question can be out and you can answer the question. If you would go again to one of the weapons there that the gentlemen were kind to bring, I simply need you to point to a weapon that could be converted. Was there a weapon in that group that could have been converted or was a product of being converted? Is there yes. anything? In that. Yes, ma'am. Could you show me that quickly, sir, Ms. Owens? I thank you very much. And would you explain whether that was found uh, in uh, the compound? This one has been converted, and I believe it was found in the vehicle. I, I'm told you can't be heard. Is that? I'm sorry, sir. Maybe you need to. This particular weapon has been converted. It's a. <coughs> semi-automatic AKS type rifle that's been modified. I believe this weapon was recovered from a vehicle located in front of the compound. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for your time. Thank you. I would just like to make a comment uh, on behalf of our side as far as these weapons are concerned. We tried uh, at uh, great length to uh, try to have access to those weapons and um, received a letter dated July 11th from uh, Mr. Kent Marcus, uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General, uh, U.S. Department of Justice, saying uh, comments that this will cost the taxpayers of the state of Texas and the United States many thousands of dollars. Uh, we just we would have enjoyed the opportunity to have worked uh, with both sides here to examine those weapons as well. And uh, I think it would have been helpful. i just make that statement. I uh, yield to the gentleman from Arizona. I understand it, a letter was sent offering that same letter, offering your ability to examine the weapons. The problem was, as I understand it, twofold. One, of course, failure analysis, whatever their last initial is, but which is in great dispute now. But secondly, they just didn't want to break the chain of, forget what the legal term is, custody because these weapons still are part of a legal process ongoing. Just, just because of the interest in terms of getting at the evidence, uh, could I ask the question of uh, how much did it cost to just bring those weapons up? Because it would have been helpful for our side as well. Anybody have any idea? Just the ballpark? Mr. Mr. Chairman, just a question. Wouldn't it be possible to, to uh, these weapons are now here? Uh, and I, I just heard some conflicting things. First, I, I heard that this was recovered in the compound, and then the gentleman just testified that the, the weapon he held up was in a vehicle in front of the compound. Uh, and then the other one is sort of charred. And I'm not a weapons expert. I never even held one of those weapons. Isn't it possible now to? turn those over temporarily to the committee and no, have someone well, independently look well, I at think those. one I think if, if I could make a comment exercise in progress of the chair I think what we tried to do uh, is to get a third party uh, or at least get get the Justice Department to x-ray these weapons make information available to all of us to determine which which weapons were altered um, and, and you know you have a, a serious heat problem in a fire uh, certain materials do get melted down, and so what we were looking for is to bring in an expert on a third-party basis to look at it, or at least get uh, all of us involved in the process so we can examine the evidence, because I think it's an important piece of evidence to consider. For a very brief and and, and the problem is the justice rates back because the process required will be expensive, cumbersome, and difficult, and of little or no um, evidentiary value to the public whom we both serve, we recommend against the procedure which you have requested, and it, besides that, it would cost the taxpayers of the state of Texas and the United States many thousands of dollars. And then we see the evidence presented here. Clarification. Mr. Owen said the weapon had been modified. Modified to do what? Machine gun. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Modified by whom? I have no idea. I guess we don't either. Uh, again, which weapon are they referring to? One is charred. The other weapon, uh, he said, was found in a vehicle in front of the compound. Uh, again, uh, we have these uh, weapons here, and I see no reason why we can't uh, 
uh, have an independent, uh, responsible authority look at the weapons and make a determination for the benefit of the General two subcommittees. I think at, at this point we need to move on to the next. Well, I just, I mean, there are a couple of points unanswered here. Number one, that were found, as I heard Mr. Ohm say, on a vehicle in front of the building, which is part of the compound. The compound is not just the building, but it's the surrounding area. It was indeed on the compound. If you read any of the literature, that's what the compound is referred to. Second, to hand over the weapons, whether it be to this committee or to a third, and a third group, the majority asked that failure analysis, paid for by the NRA, hardly an impartial source, do it, a ridiculous suggestion. How about the Department of Justice? Right. To Both hand it over to any, any third party would break the chain of custody and ruin the cases. Now, if you want to try to sit down and work something out, that's fine. Finally, the letter that you requested didn't request two weapons, but requested all the weapons be flown up here and done. That is much more well, expensive than a few. Now that we know that it can be done, maybe that's an issue for another day. I'd like to uh, now, the chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shannick. Mr. Chairman, I, I, the point of the, your, your discussion came out of my questioning, and I'd just like a clarification. I'll say it to you. Um, I think Mr. Owen may not have completed his answer to the extent uh, that uh, the question was calling for him to answer whether there were devices um, on the property, on the compound, or inside the facilities that could modify to a fully automatic. I, I assume he didn't complete his answer on that, um, that there were device modification um, equipment to modify to a fully automatic on the premises. Is that my understanding? I cannot testify to that, ma'am. You, you're not familiar with that? No, ma'am. Thank you. Chair would like to now recognize Mr. Shattuck from Arizona for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, let me resume where I was. I've spent a good deal of my career defending law enforcement. I come to these hearings with mixed emotions. I'm not here to assess blame or to point guilt. My goal isn't political. It's not to point at the administration. But there is an important goal that goes on here today. First of all, I'm pleased to see my colleagues on the other side defending law enforcement because I find historically they don't do that. But I think it's occasionally important. I object to that statement. I think it's important that. That is. I think it's important that we answer that some statement. questions here. The, the questions. The questions. Sir, statement, he, he, Mr. I Chairman. Think, I think. I think it's what he was doing. Insult, it's I think, an insult. It's an insult. I know. I know the. I know the evening's getting late. You probably didn't hear it. He's trying to compliment you. I think that's the way he intended it. No. Let's move forward, Mr. Shattuck. That's I think not the point. A funny remark, Mr. Chairman. That's an arrogant denunciation of those of us on this side of the aisle. Committee will come to order. We are owed an apology. Committee will come to order. Mr. Shattuck, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it seems to me the goal of these hearings is to try to enable the American people to have faith in law enforcement at the federal level once again. Regrettably, um, this particular incident has eaten away at their faith in law enforcement. It seems we can achieve that goal by doing one of two things. One, ascertaining what mistakes were made, if any. And two, ascertaining whether or not corrective measures have already been taken to correct those mistakes. I think we've spent the day focusing on all kinds of issues that are not issues. For example, whether or not Mr. Koresh was a gross, base human being who had uh, no business being in the position he was in and no business being able to access children as he did. That is not, I don't believe, the issue here. But I would like to get to some of the issues that I think are important for the American people, because it's my goal to rehabilitate their faith in law enforcement. Because if they have no faith in law enforcement, we don't have an ordered society. Let me, in that regard, begin with you, Mr. Aguilera. First, as I understand your testimony, it is that you were offered by Mr. Koresh, and you understood you'd been offered by Mr. Koresh, an opportunity to come and look at the weapons that he had in his, or weapons or parts of weapons that he had in his possession. Uh, Mr. McMahon had telephonically contacted Koresh and he asked me to come to the phone and um, just just well, I've got very little time did you understand and you I think you believe you said you did did you understand that you were being offered an opportunity to go look at those weapons yes sir okay now I would understand why as a law enforcement officer you would not want to take that up at that particular moment in time my question of you is did you later take that offer up no sir did you ever take that offer up no sir did you tell your supervisor specifically Mr. Sarabanya 
that you'd been offered a chance to go into the compound at Mr. Koresh's invitation and to look at the weapons? Yes, sir. It's been in my reports. You told Mr. Sarabanya that? Whether he read the reports or not, I don't know, but uh, they were in my reports. Okay. Mr. Sarabanya, were you aware when you planned the dynamic raid that one of your agents had been offered an opportunity to go in and look at the weapons and see what was there? Yes, I was, sir. It, and, and Mr. Aguilera never went. Did some other agent from ATF go? No. no sir. I, I think I, Mr. Sarabanya went. No. Is there a reason why no one ever went? Well, we, we discussed this, as I said, when we had this committee of people planning the raid. That was one of our options that we considered. Why don't we try to call the dealer and, you know, then see if we can get Kareesh off that way. But from all the intelligence we were getting at that time, when we started this investigation, everything we were told, there was armed guards, and, and at one time there was, there was a guard house or whatever. But things had changed from, from the information that we were getting back from people still on the compound, that he was now paranoid of his people, that the guns were put up. We didn't want to alert him by, you know, going the second time talking about guns, and then he might put the armed guards up and go back to the way he was before. I'm absolutely baffled that when he had this standing offer for you to be able to go and look at these weapons, you chose never to call him back and take that offer up and find out what was in there. Uh, and, and why you would not do that and still plan a dynamic raid is beyond me. Um, I mean, I, I guess I'm trying to understand why the dynamic raid was necessary when he had a standing offer that, that well, you could come in and look at those weapons. Like I said, the panel c considered this. We, t we, we talked about it. We just thought it would put him on an offensive mood and go do back you, to having armed guards. Do you now wish you'd gone back in and at least taken a look at the weapons, uh, tried to take him up on his offer? Well, we could have, yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm a little puzzled about the whole uh, timing and sequence of the uh, actual entry itself. Uh, you, I understand, Mr. Sarabanya, were in charge of the actual raid the day it occurred. Is that right? Yeah, my title was a tactical coordinator. I was the head of the SRT team. So. Okay. I was puzzled earlier, and I understood that you did not know and couldn't answer Mr. Brewster's questions about how many agents went to the door. Tell me that isn't true. I assume you knew how many agents went to the door. No, I don't know the specific number that went to the door. It was broken into six different teams. And we had several teams making entry in the front door, three teams that were going around. But I mean, I could find some list and give you the specific number, but I, I do not know it off the top of my head. But you had overall supervisory authority for the entire raid. I was like the tackle coordinator, and then each member under me was responsible for his own team. Okay. And uh, th those were the teams that would be making you know, entry. Can, can you give the American people any definitive answer on the question of whether or not agents fired from the helicopters and whether or not they fired before or after uh, Mr. People from the compound fired uh, uh, themselves. I, I, was, I was in one of the helicopters. No, nobody shot from the helicopters to the compound. Well, you were in one of the helicopters. I guess I was asking Mr. Sarabanya because he's in charge of the whole raid. What, what can we tell the American people on the issue of whether or not armed federal agents fired first or didn't fire first? We didn't fire first. According to uh, the testimony during the trial, when they were getting out of the cattle carts, they fired upon us. I'm a little, I mean, I appreciate that. I still was asking Mr. Saraban because he was in charge of the raid. And I guess if he doesn't not know how many agents were at the door, I'm troubled with how he now knows whether or not we fired first. And, and I Sir, I was, in, I was in the first vehicle pulling up on a compound. We had two vehicles. We, we don't have a picture right now. But we went down a 250-yard driveway. And then we made a left-hand turn. I was in the first vehicle, and I went in front of the compound and actually stopped. At, at the end of the compound, the second vehicle stopped at the front door. Before I opened my door to get out, we were being fired on from the compound. So I, I was going to the front door, but I never got but a few feet from the, when they began to fire at us. So uh, that's why, consequently, I do not know what happened at the front door. I would deeply I, like I to believe we fire. didn't fire first. Could I, if I could just one follow-up question. Did you, with regard to this issue of child molestation, which has been a major issue today and I think a major distraction, did you ever contact the Texas law enforcement authorities and in, who would have had jurisdiction over that? You clearly did not. Did you ever contact Texas law enforcement authorities who would have had jurisdiction over child molestation or statutory rape and invite them to participate in the raid? Uh, no, sir. I didn't invite them to participate in the raid. However, I did uh, have conversations with the district attorney there to pursue state charges on child molestation. 
And, and, and were they invited to be involved at all other than? No, sir. Uh, gentleman Spartan, thank you. Um, I'm going to do my five minutes, and then we're going to have to recess, do a vote, and come back. Believe it or not, uh, we do this every once in a while. It just happens to coincide with a hearing, so thank you for your patience. I passed out, or I'd like the clerk to pass out document number three. And my questions, uh, I'll start with Mr. Hartnick. Document number three says the raid was approved by the Bureau headquarters on or between 2-11-93 or so. I know the special aid headquarters on or between 2-11-93 or so. I know the special agent in charge, Saravan and Aquilera, met with high-ranking uh, bureau officials prior to the raid. Were you one of those officials? Yes, sir, I was. You were. And uh, the raid was approved in Washington by high-ranking bureau officials on or near February 11, 1993. Uh, did you approve that on or near that date? Yes, sir, I did. You did. And do you know whether or not, uh, when it was approved, uh, it was said to halt the raid if the element of surprise was lost? I never heard the term element of surprise. Now, let me say that surprise was a part of the plan, but nothing was ever said about the other. The document also says several pages of surveillance log had been torn out. Have you ever heard that before? No, sir, I hadn't. Who was responsible for safekeeping of the surveillance log? Uh, Littleton, I believe, li excuse me, Littleton, I believe, was a supervisor at the surveillance uh, house. Um, I just never heard that before. But, uh, but pages were removed? Oh, no, I mean, I never heard that before, that pages were removed. Okay. Well, you might want to refer to that, the, that document number three that we, we handed you. We just like, we have a copy of the document. We don't know what it is. It just has a lot of writing on it. Is it a note from who to who? Okay. This is part of the 13,000 pieces of loose paper the Treasury gave us that was, was unorganized. Um, and we, we were trying to piece it well, together, but, we, but we're at, we think it's pertinent. It certainly involves, it, we refers, to, it? Well, it refers to Mr. Higgins, um, refers to, I, mean, I think it's very pertinant. But we, uh, I just want, I'm not trying it's to be a post, it's here, a post I just want to know who wrote it. Okay. We don't know. Is it's that a post-raid interview with one of their agents, and what I'm asking is the gentleman that was in charge, uh, if he could shed some light. It, it says, there's markings on the left-hand side, Agent John Bryant, Dallas, is about all we can figure out. We have the same concerns you do. Where were we? Were you, Mr. Hartnick? about ready to answer? I'm sorry, sir. I, I just, you mentioned that notes were t torn out of the surveillance log. I was just wondering, how does that happen? I don't know, sir. I, I had never heard that before, or I, I don't recall ever hearing it before. Do you know if it was true? No, sir, I don't. Okay. Uh, so, so this may or may not apply then. The interview with the unnamed agent also says, quote, personal knowledge that the surveillance notes for the ATF were poor and incomplete. Do you have any reason to believe that the agent being interviewed is not telling the truth? I don't, I... Well, he doesn't know who the witness is, who the writer was. Well, why don't you let him answer? I mean, I know you're good, but... <laughs> so is he. I, I, I don't think I understand what you're asking, I, I guess. I um, guess, you know, that this is an interview with one of your agents, and I'm just trying to get out if the fact that if these logs get changed or tampered with or pages get pulled out, I'm just wondering if you know anything about that. No, sir, I don't. Uh, halfway down the ATF's agent's interview, this document says statements that the ATF was outgunned was true. Mr. Hartnick had uh, prior uh, to the raid ma uh, mandated that uh, we all turn in our AR-15s even though several uh, racks RACs uh, voice their complaints. Um, Mr. Hartnick, is that true? Did you mandate that the agents turn in their AR-15s? And what is an AR-15? So were these agents knowingly outgunned before they started? Why did you have them turn in the AR-15s? We were in the midst of, first of all, they had all the AR-15s that they wanted in their raid plan. I think the number, as I recall, and I could be wrong, was eight. But what was taking place at the same time was that we were converting from the AR-15 
to the uh, to a nine millimeter weapon. The reason we were doing that is that the AR-15 fires a 223 round, and 90 percent of our work are in the cities, and that round would go through one house and through another and just keep on going. Well, when these new weapons came out, I made a decision after tactical support and everybody tested these weapons that the 9 millimeter was a much better weapon to use. But in Waco, they came into us and said, we want eight, at least I think the number was eight AR-15s. They were all issued to them. But there's still a lot of, we put some AR-15s back in the field because of places like Texas that felt they still needed long range rifles. But for the most part, we were removing them from the field. But we weren't all gunned at Waco, that's for sure. Okay, uh, Mr. Sarabin, document three says the raid was approved by the Bureau headquarters on or between 2 93 or so. I notice uh, the uh, special agent in charge um, met with high-ranking bureau officials prior to the raid. Is that true? Yes, that there was a, a briefing uh, on the 11th and 12th of, of February that we were there, and it was uh, Mr. Hart, Mr. Conroy, and, and the executive staff, and then I think uh, the following day you met with Mr. Hanowski, and that's when they approved the, the raid on the 12th, actually, I believe. Thank you very much. Uh, my time has expired. Uh, we will now recess for is it one vote. So we'll recess for 15 minutes. Continue with this hearing in a few minutes. First, some programming information. Later on our companion network C-SPAN, America and the Courts. <laughs> this evening on America and the Courts, we mark the five-year anniversary of Justice William Brennan's retirement. America and the Courts, this evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, 4 p.m. Pacific. We now continue with the House Joint Subcommittee hearing of federal actions at Waco, Texas in the spring of 1993. A programming note, you can see the second day of hearings tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Hearings will reconvene. Committee come to order. <laughs> Again, I, uh, I thank the uh, patience of the witnesses and the patience of those uh, members that are still here. This is a pretty good crowd for this time of night, I think, since we started at 10 o'clock this morning. I'd like to, uh, the chair yields uh, to our good friend, uh, Mr. Conyers from Michigan, for f uh, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> on the question of uh, staleness in the warrant, I'd like to turn to Mr. Johnston. Uh, you're aware of, of the argument against uh, a warrant application being <coughs> stale. Can you uh, make any comments about it in reference to the instant case? I, I can, and let me say before I make the comments, uh, I don't claim to be uh, a... Uh, law school professor. I'm not. Jeff Moulton is. But uh, we have former U.S. attorneys here. Their judgment on this and experience would may well be better than mine. Uh, however, in the, toward that, in the fall of uh, 1992, I wondered about staleness. I felt like it was okay. In other words, a time period. But I wondered about it. And I did some uh, research at the time. I have some of the cases here. Because in firearms cases, staleness is treated a little differently. Um, 
And I, I'll just. Could, could I warn Mr. Moulton that I may ask him to share this question yeah. after Mr. Yeah. Johnson responds? And I, I found, uh, and I'll just refer to what I found that gave me feeling that we Please were okay do. on it. U.S. versus Bachelor, a nine-month interval was not too stale in the silencer case. U.S. versus McCall, a seven-month interval in a revolver case. U.S. versus Brinklow, an 11-month interval in a firearms case. U.S. versus Ron, R-A-H-N, there was a two-year interval, and that seemed extreme, but there was a two-year interval between the facts that occur, the alleged legal activity, and the search warrant affidavit. A one-year interval in U.S. versus Sims, and a 13-month interval in U.S. versus Marriott. Now, obviously, you don't want to put yourself in a position of having an arguably stale affidavit, but after the research, I felt like we were okay with it. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Moulton, uh, could you make any additional comments about the staleness uh, argument against uh, the warrant application? Certainly, Congressman. I think courts, when they're evaluating claims of staleness, uh, as Mr. Johnson suggested, look at uh, um, a couple of different factors. There's no mechanical test in terms of number of months or days or weeks that, that, that renders information stale. Two of the things they look at are the nature of the criminal activity is an isolated event like a bank robbery and, and uh, the cash from that bank robbery or is it an ongoing pattern of criminal activity. Other thing they look at is the type of evidence. Is it evidence that's likely to be dissipated or taken somewhere else quickly, again, like cash? Like drugs or, or cash. Or drugs or cash, or is it something uh, that has more permanence to it and is likely to, uh, likely to remain? And I think Mr. Johnson accurately suggested that here we've got a type of evidence, a firearm that's not ordinarily um, disposed of quickly. Clearly, Koresh, uh, over a substantial period of time, expresses interest in possessing uh, uh, automatic weapons. Uh, here, and again, the criminal activity here continued over a substantial period of time. I think that, that, that most courts, if not all courts, would conclude here that the information in the warrant was not stale. I want to remind uh, you as, as well and point out that the warrant did include information uh, in, in, the, in the late fall, early winter, uh, about hearing bursts of gunfire at the compound. Uh, so, so it's not the case that, that all the information was, was eight months old or so. Of course. Uh, you're familiar with the uh, Fifth Circuit case of Batista versus Henderson on staleness? I, I'm not, I may have read that case. No, it, it, it goes it. along with the same direction that we were moving in. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sarabin, uh, isn't it correct that the document that uh, was introduced by Chairman Zella uh, before the break that was uh, unidentified is now identified uh, as to be one of a Mr. Larry Sparks? Yes. Yes. Uh, do you have it in your hand? Someone just told me that. Well, yeah. well, who established the identity? Well, l let me let me continue the question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, how how has this been established as belonging to Mr. Sparks? I don't know. I just walked it's back. Work product. Product. You're, you're, you're not sure. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I can't hear the witness. Uh, could he? Pull the mic, Pull your mic up a little closer, sir. I just came back to the table, and, and several people standing here just said that this came from Larry Sparks. Okay, we, we'll come back to it. I, I've got two colleagues that would like a little time. And Mr. Green, gentleman from Texas, I'll yield to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me ask first, Mr. Moulton, uh, one of the allegations about this hearing is that, uh, that who asked for the investigation that was made? Do you know who asked for this report to be made? Yes, it, um, yes, uh, Congressman, I do. It was, uh, it was the President of the United States who asked the report, the investigation be conducted. Okay. So, you know, even though we're two years late, this, the President asked for this report much earlier, right after uh, the incident. He asked for the report, I believe, uh, on April 19th, 1993. Okay. Mr. Owen, let me, since you brought out the AK-47 with the folding stock, uh, let me ask you a little bit about some of the weapons. And again, looking at this report and... In the charred remains, we see the grenade casings and, and also a, a picture of looks like a warehouse of the, that bus that was, uh, that was used as a, as a bunker. 
Um, in the findings, did you find any AR-15s or AKs that had been converted? Yes, sir. Okay. How many? Because under earlier testimony from the gun dealer, he had sold at least 200 uh, weapons to Mr. Koresh, and no telling how many more he could have bought at gun shows on his own. But do you have any idea of, from the inventory? Uh, from a very preliminary examination, as the weapons were brought to the evidence collections point, I identified 50 probable machine guns. Okay, when you say probable machine guns, again, you know, it's not illegal for me to own 200 uh, AKs that are semi-automatic. That's correct. But it's illegal if I own them and they've been converted or they're automatics or machine guns. That's correct. Okay. So, so you feel pretty confident there were 50 automatic weapons that were found in the charred remains at, at Mount Carmel? Yes, sir. Okay. What about the grenade casings? Uh, did you see any of them that had any filament in them or anything that, you know, because we also heard testimony that, that uh, not only were there cases of casings, but there was also ingredients to be able to, to stuff them. Did you find, did anyone find any in them? Congressman, I cannot speak to the hand grenades. Okay. Does anyone else on the panel who did any investigation uh, can speak with, with personal knowledge? Because I guess I, I don't like to hear, I, I guess I've heard hearsay so much today that it'd be nice to have personal knowledge. I did the work on the hand grenades and okay. uh, you have to ask them. We'll have them, we'll have them here. Let me ask, uh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Sorry Chairman. about that. Thank you, Mr. Conner. Okay, Chair now recognizes uh, Mr. McCollum. Thank you very much. I just want to clarify a few things with you in the brief time I've got this evening, gentlemen. Mr. Sarabin, uh, who is Larry Sparks? Um, he was the, the previous supervisor in Austin, Texas. Uh, at any time did you have a conversation with Mr. Sparks or anyone else where you said to them that you believe that several of the items mentioned in the arrest and search warrants involved in this case were not true? Never. That has been reported in some conversations that we see in the record of Mr. Sparks. Are you aware he's made such a statement? I don't know if Mr. Sparks... Not necessarily that on that piece of paper. I'm not referring to that piece of paper. What was your question, sir? I'm, I'm just asking if you were aware that Mr. Sparks may have made such a statement at any time. No. All right. Fair, fair enough. Uh, Mr. Aguilar, I don't have you back as a witness on another day. And in order to avoid bringing you back, I want to ask you a couple more questions about the raid day itself, even though that's not the primary topic here. You were in a helicopter that day, as I understand it, correct? Yes, sir, I was. Uh, you had guns on that helicopter, is that yes, correct? Yes, sir, I did. Were those guns ordered to be downloaded? I had a gun. I had You my had a gun. There was a, well, was there only one gun on that helicopter? I don't you know had if a gun. Anybody, anybody else had one. I know I had my pistol with me. How about any rifles? No, sir, I Were didn't. there any rifles on that helicopter? No, sir, not that I... Not that Are I, you aware whether there were any rifles on any of the other... There were two other helicopters, were there not? Yes, sir, but I don't know. If you don't were. know whether they were or not? No, were sir. Were you ordered to have your gun downloaded? No, sir, I had mine... Uh, you had it loaded? Loaded, yes, All sir. All right. Uh, do you know if there were any shots fired from your helicopter that day? There were no shots fired. Do you know whether there were shots fired from either of the other helicopters? No, I have couldn't testify knowledge? to that. All right. Uh, isn't it true you took fire, your helicopter took fire? That's correct. Uh, could you have fired back because of it under the rules of engagement as you knew it that day? You know, I'm not asking whether you did, but I ask you whether you could have. Could I have fired? Yes. No, sir. Not from where the position I was in. No, but by you would have been permitted to have fired back is what I'm getting at. I not wouldn't whether have you fired. physically thought you could, but but under the rules of engagement that day, when you were fired upon, could you not have then fired back? Yes, sir. If I was being fired at, yes, sir. I mean, you were being fired at at some point. Yes, sir. Were you not? Yes, right. sir. Thank you. Um, I got to clarify one other thing here. Uh, Mr. Hartnett, uh, Mr. Moulton earlier this evening said, uh, as I recall to the response to a request to Ms. Jackson Lee, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that there was no cover-up involved in this matter by the Treasury Department at all. Do you agree with that comment? No, I don't. Why? I feel that the Treasury Department has said things since the time of um, uh, the raid at Waco that, that have been incorrect. 
uh, I feel that the Treasury report, where it says some very good things that should be done, uh, things that we could correct in law enforcement, I think it also had many omissions, distortions, and uh, false statements in it. And why do you believe those omissions and false statements are in that report? I believe that they were concerned about the, the fallout from the media, that they couldn't just say that management uh, uh, at the scene there was made mistakes, but that wasn't the tone of the report. They felt like they had to write a scathing report, which made a lot of people suffer, like Chuck and, and some of those other people down there that were just doing their job, and it was, I think, very biased and unfairly written. And you think that was a cover-up of sorts for what? I think they felt like, and I don't know if cover-up is a term that I would use, uh, I would say that they felt like they had to, at least when it came to the press, show that they were taking some very strong action and they weren't responsible for anything and these managers down there had done this uh, intentionally uh, and, and that just was not the case. And you said earlier that uh, the element of surprise was the first time you ever heard of it was when that, uh, after the day of the raid. That's uh, correct. Is that part of your concern? Certainly it is, because I think that, that the media picked up on it, and, you know, I would have to say that I used it too. We all started using it after the raid, and it was a foolish thing to do. I sort of got trapped by the media, yeah. trapped myself. But it throws a whole different perspective on what those commanders did down there. And I just, I think it's three weeks ago, I, I saw the Assistant Secretary Noble on a national broadcast say that Treasury and ATF had ordered those commanders not to go forward if they lost the element of surprise. And I am the only person who was giving principally direct orders to those commanders. And I never gave such an order, and I never received such an order. Now, we did talk about safety. I mean, we must have talked about safety a hundred times. And the director called me the night before the raid, said be sure to mention it again to him. Uh, if anything isn't right, you see guns, anything, shut it down. Yes, we did talk about that constantly. But the term element of surprise, I never heard it until the media started using it, our own public affairs, after the raid. Thank you very much. We'll undoubtedly pursue questioning along these lines further as the hearings progress. Thank you, Mr. Harden. Sir, if I may interject, I attended a meeting uh, with Mr. Higgins, Mr. Hartnett, Chuck Sarabin, and uh, I was asked the same question. And I told them that I didn't recall quite clearly, but I do believe that the element of surprise was asked by Mr. Higgins. If the element of surprise was going to be lost, don't, don't continue on, this, on, the, on the raid. You, when as was far that, as I when can remember. When is this remember. meeting that you attended, Mr. Aguilar? This was the meeting that I went up to headquarters with uh, Chuck Serban when? and Mr. Hoynowski. When? Uh, what time? I believe. What date? I don't recall. I don't have my notes with before, me. It was, before the, the, it was prior to the raid. How long before, roughly? Uh, I would say maybe two to three weeks. All right. we, we will have to uh, come back and revisit this with you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Mr. Aguilera, uh, Mr. Yan testified that all, ri all rifle or all gun chambers were to be emptied by the ATF. Uh, and I, I just was, I would just like, to, this is a pertinent question, and, and uh, you indicated that your weapon was loaded. Did you did you did you miss did you violate any rules by that? I didn't violate any rules. I'd never heard of that until today. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate your kindness since uh, Mr. McCullen brought up my questioning, and I, I just needed to know whether Mr. Harnett intended to make a blatant statement that this was a cover-up by the Treasury Department. There may have been some misstatements and we are here to correct and to improve but are you saying that this was a blatant five months report that covered up all of the wrongs that might have occurred no i'm not saying that thank you sir thank you. thank you very much it's been a long day uh we appreciate uh, uh i i think you just got one and, and let's let's not start another two-hour siege here uh i I am going to conclude the hearings. I would like to thank you all, the witnesses, very much for their testimony. Uh, we will adjourn. Uh, meeting stands adjourned until 9.30 tomorrow morning. Hold on.
Okay. Chairman. I'm sorry. Uh, I'd like a unanimous consent that the documents that I distributed to uh, Mr. Johnston earlier uh, be, uh, be included in the record. Without, object, uh, without you. objection, so Mr. Ordered. Chairman, for another unanimous consent. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that Mr. Hardin be required to come before this committee again and explain the extent of the coverage. He what will be really there. If you that? look at your scheduled witnesses, he's, he's scheduled. Thank you very much. Meeting adjourned. Programming note, you can see the second day of hearings tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern. We'll hear testimony from former officials from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Tonight on C-SPAN, the second day of the Whitewater hearings, the Senate Special Whitewater Committee began their investigation this week, Saturday night at 2 a.m. Eastern Time on our companion network, C-SPAN. C-SPAN Sunday.